So we're going to open up the floor to any questions. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and start with uh, sort of, sort of some questions for the panel. Uh, you know, for Dr. Fu, do you think that rehabilitation, uh, you know, is helpful even months or years after treatment? And, you know, how uh, do patients know when they should seek care from a rehab specialist? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think patients, uh, patients definitely years after uh, their treatment can have uh, rehabilitation goals. They might even have some neurologic recovery. Uh, you know, it may not be a huge amount of recovery, but but even small changes uh, could 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 come could make us come up with new goals for your rehab. So. Um, you know, it's not unusual for me to have send someone back to rehab to to rehab uh, two years after after treatment. Um, you know, talk it over with your your rehab doctor or even your you know your oncologist or primary care doctor if you have goals that you you want to try to address. Um, I, I, I think it's it's still very useful. Um, and also, patients become deconditioned with age, or they may suffer radiation necrosis, which might which which might cause new neurologic symptoms. So I encourage. Um, I encourage everyone to stay active, to try to, to, to maximize their function as much as possible, and I think you know re rehab later on is is part of that. Thanks. Questions? Dr. Demonte. That's really cool. Um, is the uh, pre pre more pre surgical? Uh, work you guys are doing, and, and tell me, uh, tell us how how that's uh, what you see, how that impacts outcomes from surgery, both for cranial or spinal surgery. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, it's a it's exciting area for us in rehab. Um, actually, at MD Anderson, we're doing it with GI surgery right now, and we're starting it up with BMT, so before the bone marrow transplant. Um, there, the evidence is that you know, people, a lot of people are doing studies on this. A lot of the the ends, the cohorts are pretty small, you know, 20 to 30. Um, and and the and actually some of them are done by anesthesiologists, believe it or not, because it's sort of like this post anesthesia. Um, that's that's sort of how they're getting into it. But uh, yeah, the evidence isn't sort of uh, real solid yet. But there's a lot of interest in that, and it seems to suggest there might be something going on. We're also doing we're also collecting data on those patients, um, and it's exciting for us for, for rehab doctors because. You know, most of the time, what we do, and this is whole thing, this whole concept of exercise is cancer rehab. Most physiatrists and therapists, what they do, it's focused on quality of life. We're not so much involved in making people survive longer or, or improving medical outcomes. But this is an area where we actually might be getting into this. Um, so, uh, and I and I think neurosurgery actually lends itself very well. And, and also with prehab, it you know, may not just be the exercise and strengthening and improving your condition and maximizing your nutrition. A lot of it also may be on patient education, sort of, you know, what can you expect? Um, you know, why don't we train you to learn how to, your, to catheterize yourself now, since we have, if we have a little bit of time, maybe you're getting key, adjuvant chemo or something, we'll work on training you how to do the do the bowel program and, and, and these other things so that also afterwards you have a smoother course. So it's not just exercise, it's, it's education, I think, as well, and nutrition. For uh, Dr. Roldan, for, um, you know, patients seeking pain management specialists outside of, you know, cancer center, what advice would you give in terms of finding the right specialist? It's a little bit a uh, tricky question because many, many pain providers out of the cancer centers, uh, and I see quite often they don't want to, uh, they, they don't want to include patients that require narcotics. Some of them are putting restrictions on their practice, or many other providers are not comfortable treating cancer patients. And uh, there's no question there's an advantage of having um, the, all the services in the same place where we all can communicate. I can easily email or um, you know share any questions or concerns to the provider in the same center. I can also access all the information entering into the medical records and the imaging, so it will make uh, care much easier if it's in the same place. But yes, there's no question there's gonna be some um, difficulties in finding the providers outside of the uh, cancer centers. With all the concern, ooh, <laughs> scared myself. <laughs> 
with all the concerns about opioid overdosage and everything that's going on right now in the country, um, I'm finding it a challenge to get narcotics prescribed. Um, you know, by my, I have a family doctor because my treatment is in another state and I can't just go back and forth when I, I need something for pain. And it's really a challenge and I know it is for others. Is this the way it's gonna be in the future that those of us who really need this for our conditions are going to continue to be having problems getting access to the most, uh, you know, drugs that will work? You know, I don't really know the answer because we encounter that very often. Their interstate law is completely variable. There are some places that we cannot prescribe electronically, for example. We also prefer that somebody who's taken, who, that we place into uh, narcotics to do a follow-up regularly, you know, if not every month, at least every maximum three months. And we have many patients that live in other states and we prefer that. We are under, regula under regulations as well. Um, one thing I was talking about today is that we're in a cancer center, so we so, sort of get a pass by the government because we're cancer, we're MD Anderson, so we have a little bit more of freedom, but I can see that uh, outside of a cancer center, there's gonna be a lot of restrictions and limitations regarding the narcotics, and one thing that is very interesting, I find um, many of my patients that I don't wanna place narcotics for whatever reason, uh, I, I get into, I encounter the insurance companies that, the, we're not on the same page. Um, to give you an example, I try to use certain medication that are not considered narcotics, and then the insurance company answers, no, it's not approved. How about consider this one? Completely the opposite. All the narcotics that we're trying to avoid, those are the ones the insurance companies find cheaper, and those are the ones that tell you, no, why don't you use that first before we use the one that you're suggesting? So it's, it's a problem. We all have the same problem. Do you have a question? Oh. <laughs> yes, on, on the touch of, uh, you know, like uh, Frederick mentioned about insurance company plans, but insurance company denials is getting to be a big issue also because they try to tilt the scale on their favor by throwing mud or whatever kind of theories they want to say, I'm denying coverage. Then they leave it up to the burden to the physician, which don't have time to fight the insurance companies and or the patients. and the patient has to have the resources to fight them, legal action, then go through the arbitration system. In theory, would it help to be able to have a set of standards like Cardoma Cancer to say, okay, these set of boards and cancer centers have determined these are the best options for treatments. Now all of a sudden you put weight on the scale to the patient and to the doctor. Now the, the insurance company's on the tail end to try to debunk your standards that you set for the, like the Cardoma uh, Cancer Foundation. Wouldn't, it, wouldn't that help out a lot in the wait so it help out the physician and the patient? I, I can talk a little bit about that. I, I published, a, so getting inpatient rehab approval from insurance companies is a real problem for us. For us, some insurance companies are more willing to give it than others, and it's really frustrating. You know, patient A and patient B, they, they both pay good money to, for their insurance companies, and then you know, one, one's denying them, the other one's not, and, and they didn't know that uh, you know, whatever company said has a tendency to not approve inpatient rehab. Uh, and I was able to find a statistically significant difference, and, I, you know, I, and of course everyone knows that this happens, this, but, but I, you know, I published about it. Um, a lot of times, so I, I argue with uh, with medical directors quite a bit about trying to approve them for inpatient rehab. And um, if you have evidence, that will help you. If you have papers and you have, uh, and I can speak from the rehab world, we have you know, evidence and papers that, that what we do works and that this is the standard of care. Um, and I agree, we, we need, um, I, I think it would be nice if organizations uh, in the rehab world or in the neurosurgery or neuro-oncology world, we're able to come up with specific guidelines about what to, to sort of get rid of this gray area and make it more black and white. This is what you need to provide. But, um, you know, it, it's, at least I can say in my, in my world, it's, it's unfortunately, we're still not there yet. And I've, you know, I've recommended this to people, but it's sort of a fight that's bigger than me. 
uh, that has to go to probably our, our big professional organizations. Yeah, and I could speak from the non from the non physician side. Uh, we have a little bit of that. So like the, the NCCN, the National Cancer uh, Center Network. Uh, you know, we, I know MD Anderson Fall is part of that. Several of the cancer uh, facilities are a part of that. Uh, and, and a lot of insurance agencies, a lot of the insurance companies follow NCC, NCCN guidelines. Um, however, they also tweak them as well. And so, uh, you know, you look at the, the number of authorizations now uh, that, that Dr. Fu was just talking about, the number of authorizations are, are ridiculous. Um, the, our financial clearance center uh, works kind of catty corner to where I am in, in, in our building. Um, they're out trying to get authorizations for any kind of diagnostic services, your MRIs, your CTs, and you're finding the insurance companies are, are, are really trying to close the funnel on some of those and, and really uh, add more and more services to those prior authorizations, which delays care and makes it more difficult to get, to get paid um, in some instances as well. So I know it's something that, that, um, that we, keep kind of, we keep pushing from our perspective, and I know a, a lot of the, the hospital organizations are pushing. Um, but you're right, the insurance companies are, are taking advantage of the word managed care, it's saying it's managed care, and they're, and they're trying to, to keep those costs within, within a, certain, a, a certain box and, and, and trying to make it a little bit more difficult, I think, sometimes for, from operationally to get things um, paid for. For the, you know, the, they're, they're, the insurance companies are starting to talk about bundled care and, and value how, based that, care, yep. how that might affect yeah. some of the things he's experiencing because it may be, because now it's just a big pot of money. Yeah, what right. So, is, so, yeah, so now, so, they're, so the insurance companies now are, are, are trying to push more bundled care, more value based care where they want providers to um, share in the risk of, of, of the treatment. So, it, it, a simple example, they might say, okay, I've got a pot of $1,000, um, and, and you know, you're going to treat patient XYZ with this particular disease, and we think it should be uh, a cost of $1,000 to treat that patient. I'll tell you what, if you can treat that patient for less than $1,000, you can share in those savings. So if you can treat them for $750, we'll split the $250 with you, and it, it kind of it, it kind of incentivizes the provider to try to keep some of those costs down. Because in, in essence, you know, I guess there's, there, you know, there's, there's blame on both sides, right? So I'm sure you've got providers that, are, that might be ordering tests that may be ordering them too soon or, or it's not the most appropriate test. Um, but you definitely have, have the insurance companies that are trying to manage that cost. So bundled payments where they're going to try to set a set amount for a particular treatment plan and um, try to get providers to, to manage that cost a little bit better uh, from a financial incentive. And that's, they've been pushing those, those type models uh, over the last several years. I think we have the last question right here. Do you think that in the future, uh, insurance companies will have a, a way to, uh, to not to uh, pay uh, based on previous existing condition? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm, like for pre-existing conditions, um, yeah, so I know um, the ACA allowed that. I think there were some grandfathered plans that 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 came in that, that still wouldn't cover pre-existing conditions. But one of the one of the to me one of the great things about the kind of the Affordable Care Act was they did have that pre-existing um, didn't matter pre-existing conditions didn't matter, and so you should have been able to get coverage through the ACA um, even though you had a pre-existing condition. I know that's something that. Um, the president has mentioned that he wants to keep in whatever health care term or health care we're going to have in the next in the next year or so. Um, and I know uh, Congress has been pushing for that as well. So I'm hoping they're going to keep that aspect of the Affordable Care Act still intact to where there's no um, you know, there's no denials for insurance just because someone has a pre-existing condition. Because um, the reality of it is if you're going to provide if you're going to provide health care for all, um, those folks that may not have had health insurance to begin with are probably coming in with some pre-existing pre -existing condition anyway because they really haven't had medical care. I'd like to thank our speakers for this great session.